Thank you, and I'll try to live up to the standards of John Bowles and others in this series. But it's not any news to anybody here that we're living at a time of onrushing changes unlike any ever before in human history. Out of that, my assignment today is twofold. Number one, first to identify the, what I think might be the most important of these developments uh, as they may affect Rice University, and second, to try to depict how the university can capitalize on our strengths to seize opportunities that are offered by these truly major technological and economic and demographic changes, while all at the same time trying to avoid a lot of red ink in our operations. And that's no mean task. I want to consider the distant past as a prelude to the near future. John Bowles would be happy to know that the older I get, the more I go, the more historian I become. And when I retire, I will be teaching a course, I hope, in ancient and medieval economic history, because that is a flourishing field now, and there's so much to be learned. But enough of that. Let's go way back, more than 100,000 years ago. There's recent archaeological evidence reported last year in Science Magazine that suggests that over 100,000 years ago, ancestors to modern Homo sapiens secured a vital advantage that along with other traits enables them to crowd out all of their other potential competitors because there were other humanoids around at the same time. What was it? They learned to cook their food, thereby reaping notable increases in body weight and strength and height and otherwise improving the robustness and the capacity of vital organ systems. Now, cooking, of course, requires fire, which in turn was the sine qua non of all the earliest technologies. And cultures around the world, you may be aware, had different accounts of how fire came to humans. The Aborigines of South Australia had their own fire bringer. Hebrew mythology had another. Greek mythology, of course, credited Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods to benefit mortals, for which he paid by having himself chained to a rock and having his liver pecked at by vultures throughout all eternity. But by whatever name he was called in ancient culture, the gifts made possible by Prometheus and the likes of Prometheus, the, the gifts that they brought made possible over the ages bricks, very important in human history, the settling of northern climes, metallurgy, and therefore the plow and the sword. The final flowering of fire-based technology came with the Industrial Revolution, which brought steam power and later the internal combustion engine. These technologies allowed real per capita income, that is adjusted for inflation, real per capita income to expand almost sixfold from 1870 until today. This unprecedented prosperity brought with it steep improvements in nutrition, sharp declines in mortality, and for the first time in human history, notable declines in fertility in North America, Europe, and Japan because in the days of the ancients, population was kept in check primarily by large-scale deaths from pestilence and disease. But this did, with greater prosperity and better diets and, and better health, this changed and we had, for the first time, declines in fertility. Now, as striking have, as have been, as were the effects of technological, technological change in the 1800s, they of course pale beside the past quarter century and the promise of the coming century, or the century we're already in. It's almost as if Prometheus had been unbound to steal again secret, secrets from the gods to bring new gifts and, while he's at it, new threats to the world. So we have a world of incessant change. Now, although you would not know it from following the swan dive of NASDAQ uh, beginning about a year ago, we are now in the early stages of an acceleration in the rate of technological change unprecedented in history. And these changes will surely radically alter the structure of the world economy with lasting, transforming effects on human beings. 
And not all of these effects may be positive. Modern counterparts of Prometheus are offering gifts far less tangible but no less pretentious and in some cases more ominous as fi than fire. Scientists are deep in the process of unlocking the remaining mysteries of nature from the bizarre mini miniature world of quantum mechanics to the infinite realm of the deep cosmos. Nanoscale scientists are showing the way to new materials having incredible properties not naturally occurring in nature. Biology, which only a few short years ago was confined to the study of life, now enables us to alter life almost at will as bioscientists unlock more of the secrets of genetics. Applications from these new scientific discoveries are proliferating in information technology and biomedicine and transportation and energy and agriculture and construction and even in recreation. All these foreshadow brave new worlds holding perhaps limitless promise as well as some peril because these new gifts bring some risk also. In any case, these new technologies have given human beings a capacity to exert an unprecedented degree of control over their environment, perhaps even over, think about it, perhaps even over our own evolution. You remember Blade Runner? I watched Blade Runner this weekend, and I am no longer surprised at what I saw. Whereas 22 years ago, I thought, ho, 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 science fiction writers have finally gone off the deep end. Mm. Uh, so the, 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 we perhaps now will control not only our own environment, but maybe our own evolution. This sets us apart, not just from all other species, but from all our ancestors, both ancient and modern. So we really are very different, and we really need to be a lot more careful than we have been throughout most of human history. What can be said though, we've been talking about mostly technology in the past, what of technology in the future? Well, it is well to bear in mind that the business of predicting is very risky. I've always said that I am one of those economists who does not make predictions, especially about the future. Thank you. In the words of Benjamin Disraeli, what we anticipate does not regularly occur while what we least expect often happens. With that caveat in mind, I'm emboldened to say that I believe that in the coming century, the world will be reshaped by five new technologies, okay? Number one is information technology, including, of course, computational science. Number two, technological outgrowths of gene science, both human and non-human. Number three, nanotechnology, which I will explain in a minute. What are the other two technologies? They haven't even been imagined yet, much less invent invented, although they will occur, but I'll have nothing to say about them since I don't know what they are. But let's go back to the three that we know a smattering about now. Consider first information technology. If I were not at Rice, and if I weren't hanging around the likes of Ken Kennedy and Sid Burris and Moshe Vardy, I would not be aware of the, the revolution that has been wrought by information technology. But I am around these people, and I am aware. And let me tell you a little bit about it. Until just a few decades ago, the world economy was almost exclusively dependent on human brawn in producing corporeal products, steel, lumber, Kleenex, grain, etc. New scientific insights into the law of nature have year by year meant that ideas, discoveries, have substituted for brawn and material bulk. As a result, a very large share of world commerce is now dominated by virtually weightless conceptual products information services, computational capacities, and the like. Do you need any proof? Consider that in 1998, 
the real GNP, inflation adjusted, the real GNP total, not per capita, of the United States was, in 1997 dollars, 8.103 billion, okay? No, not 8.8103 billion, okay? That was 20 times real GNP of 1900. Now, Alan Greenspan often says that if we could weigh today's GNP, and if we could also somehow weigh the GNP of 1900, we would probably find that the physical weight of today's GNP is only moderately higher than it was a hundred years ago, even though the real value of today's GNP is 20 times greater. Technological advances account for virtually all of this phenomenon. The worth of things used to be determined, even in my boyhood, by what physical components and brute human effort went into them. And this is why people so eagerly searched for gold and tin and oil and gas, or they invested so heavily in growing rubber or timber. The declining importance both of muscle power and material bulk is evident from long-term price trends of unskilled labor. The wages of unskilled labor have been falling steadily for the past 70 years, 70 years relative to the wages of the skilled. And real inflation-adjusted prices for virtually all raw materials, including gold, has been declining for decades because of slow growth in demand for them relative to other products. Okay? Still, throughout much of history, up until very recent times, improvements in standards of living and quality of life depended primarily upon the growth of what we call in economics physical capital, including land and factories and natural resources. This is no longer so. By 1996, the value of what we call human capital, some people don't like to use this term, but I say go get, you know, live with it, because there's not a better term. If I could think of a more artful term, I would, it's human capital. What is that? That's the skills and the knowledge embedded in people. And the value of human capital is now about, or it was even by 1996, three times the value of all the physical capital in the United States. Now, the, these, the fruits of human capital have joined together with technological advances in computer sciences and electrical engineering and managerial innovations to yield this re onrushing information revolution that now permeates into every corner of our society. You cannot hide from it. In fact, it is, although I said I don't make predictions, this is somebody else's prediction, so I'll tell you about it. It's a pretty safe bet that within 10 years, 10 short years, personal computers will have the power of a supercomputer, but they'll have no keyboard or no screen, and they'll be small enough, they'll be even smaller than this thing I've got in my pocket to let you hear me. They'll be about a third that size. And you will just speak to the machine, asking what, what you want to know, and it will give you an answer. Star Trek is not that far off. So when someone asks you, they say, what is this new information and knowledge economy all about? You can say, well, it's, it's about information and knowledge. Because that's what it is about. Now, the second defining technology of the century to come is, of course, biomedicine. I have a colleague at Chicago who I love dearly, uh, Bob Fogel. Bob shows, Bob's research clearly shows that we are still, he's a Nobel laureate, by the way. Did I tell you that? Yes, okay. Yeah, he, he, Bob's research shows that we're still reaping the benefits of our social investments in the biomedical research of the 1870s and the 1880s and the early 1900s. So, biomedical research has already had huge payoffs to society, and we haven't seen anything yet. Consider, for example, the luminous promise of gene therapy. And the flip side of that, of course, is the 
the dark side of gene therapy, but I'm focusing on the luminous promise now. Just a decade has gone by since NIH scientist W. French Anderson fired the shot heard around the world that was administering to a young girl the first artificial gene to cure a hereditary illness. By the way, it mostly worked, okay? Since then, we've learned more about the workings of human genes in the last half century following the discovery of the double helix by two modern counterparts of Prometheus, Watson and Crick. We've learned more in the last few years than in the entire 50 years before. Advances in gene science and gene therapy in the coming 10 years are, I guarantee you, going to be even more stunning because the theoretical understanding developed in genetics over the past few years is going to render commonplace medical applications once viewed as unthinkable. The joining of the insight of the geneticist with the very advanced tools, and this is the real key, you see, with the very advanced tools of information and computational science, you'll see now that biomedicine and information sciences cannot be spoken of in two sentences. You've got to speak of them together, but I'll get to that in a minute. And that's going to open up, uh, that com combined with the skills of the biomedical engineers will open up still undiscovered frontiers. So now, by now it should be apparent that biology itself is rapidly becoming what? An information science. Increasingly, mathematical and statistical and computer methods are absolutely indispensable in the analysis of biological and biochemical and biophysical data. There's a new field that integrates all of these areas and it is called bioinformatics, about which more a little bit later. Now, the third defining technology of the next century, nanotechnology, is also closely linked to both the informational and computational revolution and to the new biomedicine. Nanotechnology is the application of nanoscience, which is the science of the incredibly small. Here the focus of attention is upon objects measuring one billionth of a meter, about three normal atoms across. You can imagine it, but, and you can barely see it with a scanning tunneling microscope, but it's there. Moreover, advances in nanoscale science feed back onto the two previous fields that I mentioned, information technology and biomedicine, and they feed back on each other. It works both in both directions. Work in molecular computing at Rice has spawned a new field called molecular electronics that could lead to immensely faster and drastically cheaper computers. We're talking about ubiquitous computers, computers in everything, computers in every appliance, computers in the doors, in your mattress of your bed, each costing eight or nine cents a piece, all to do certain specialized functions. Even there's talk of little chips in your body to give you increased physical powers. I don't know, but the others I'm pretty sure about. Nanoscale science allows us to arrange individual atoms one by one to make the items that we think we need. And as noted, nanotechnology bids fair to rev revolutionize communication and computing because it'll allow ever more powerful computers to keep shrinking in size and in cost. In power generation, nanotechnology could make solar cells immensely more efficient and at last cheap solar power a reality. Nanotechnology will, without much question, transform material science. Richard Smalley's nanotubes being made right here on the Rice campus. We are the world's distributor for this kind of nanotube, by the way. These nanotubes of Rick should enable us to fabricate fibers at least a hundred times stronger than any earthly metal at less than one-fifth the weight. The potential applications of nanotechnology and biomedicine are absolutely breathtaking. This technology will open up an unusually wide range of opportunities for harness harnessing molecular structures for biomedical purposes, including the production of rationally engineered pharmaceutical products, not taking substances found in nature, 
but inventing new substances without the, the traditional chemical methods. Nanoscale biosensors, without much doubt, will eventually silently monitor all critical bodily functions. Other totally unanticipated technologies will doubtless arise before too long, but we're going to be hard pressed as a society and as a university to just deal sensibly with the three technologies that I have mentioned. Together they could set humanity free, free from malnutrition, free from needless suffering, and free from premature disability or death. Alternatively, unwise deployment of these technological marvels could unleash social and economic and spiritual misery on a scale not seen since the end of the Dark Ages 600 years ago. And if you want to be reminded of that, go back and watch Blade Runner. It'll have more of an impact on you now than when you were much younger.